him for the fear wherewith he, wherewith he feared me and was, ref, was afraid of my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was never in his lips. He walked with me, it with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from their sins. They're at Mount Hor. Moses tells Aaron, put on your priestly garments. He was supposed to only wear those priestly garments on one day of the year, right? Everybody saw Aaron and Moshe and Eleazar take a walk. And they walked and walked and ended up, they could see them walking up the mountain. And at the mountain, Moses took Aaron's clothes and put him on his oldest living son, Eleazar, and he died there. When they came back, there was only two of them. They knew that something had happened to Aaron. And they knew that it must have been death. Commentary says that, you know, Moses said, today's my birthday. I can see real good. I feel pretty good. There's nothing wrong with me, but I just can't lead you anymore. They say that Aaron was in perfect health. But when he laid down, it says Moses, and basically Eleazar had his plain white robe on, and him and his father exchanged clothes, and it's supposed to be in a cave, and Moses told his older brother, now lay down, close your eyes, close your mouth, and it was over. The Jewish people say that Moses and Aaron both died by the, the kiss of God. God literally bent down and kissed them men you know, on their lips or whatever and took their souls. No pain, no, no nothing. But the people wept for Aaron. And for 30 days, now I'm, I'm pretty sure I can prove this from Shemos chapter 19 that when we read in the Torah, the house of Israel, it's about the women. But here we have a word added to it, the entire house of Israel. The women led the nation in the morning of Aaron and made sure that everybody uh, recognized what they had lost. Because Mar Aaron, like we read in Malachi, Aaron would, if he heard two people arguing, he would find them and try to break up the argument and take time with each one of them. Literally, he was the peacemaker. Okay, we're going to chapter 21 now. And Steve's going to read, and he's going to read the first 11 verses. 11, okay. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by way of Atharim, then he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utterly destroyed them in their cities. Thus the name of the place was called Hormah. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. 
because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone, everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Now the sons of Israel moved out and camped in Oboth. They journeyed from Oboth and camped at I Abirim in the wilderness, which is opposite Moab to the east. Okay, thank you. When they left, when they couldn't go through Edom, they went back and they actually took the route that Moshe told the spies to take from the south to the north. And while they journeyed in verse 4, the spirit of the people grew short. Then they spoke against Elohim and against the Moshe. What was their problem? Our soul is disgusted with this insubstantial food. What was that? the manna, the most perfect thing that a human being was ever privileged to digest in his body. The perfect food. And they called it unsubstantial, tasteless. It, supposedly, the righteous who ate the manna, as they were eating it, their mind would go back to last Thanksgiving when they had this huge feast and there was all kinds of good food that we had. And they took a bite of manna and hmm, that was a sweet potato casserole. But the unrighteous never were blessed by the manna that they ate. They sent, God sent, okay, Miriam died, the rock quit giving water, Aaron died, the clouds of protection disappeared. I always contend that the clouds on the sides and the front and the back was kind of like a fire extinguisher. It was cold and it kept the, the bad things in the desert from coming into the area. Well, without that, they were free to roam. They came and these weren't just snakes. These were fiery snakes. These, when they bit to the person, it felt like their body was on fire and they would die very quickly. People began to realize and they said again, we have sinned, we have spoken against Yahweh and against you, Mose. Pray to Yahweh to remove us from these serpents. And Yahweh said to Moses, make of yourself a an it's actually a bronze idol of a snake on a pole. You can see it in the, when you walk in the KU Medical Center. Right there as you walk in, there's a big wall, and there's this big brass bronze thing there, and there's this snake on this pole. This is another one of them statutes that don't make a bit of sense. If you got bit and you were dying, if you could see before this year, I thought Aaron, just like Aaron ran with the incense through the plague, I thought Aaron did this, but he's dead. So Moses is running with this bronze idol snake, holding it as high as he could. And when people would see it, they would be healed. Because instead of looking down at your leg and watching it swell up and turn red or black or whatever, you were actually looking up at, to God. So if a person looked at it, they lived, if not. You know something? Very quickly, the, back in 1988, 89, that Saturday that Janet and I took a tour of 
Grandview, Missouri. The Lord was beginning to take us out of the church to put us back into the church like Maryland. That little bookstore, I bought a little tiny book. Wasn't very many pages. I don't remember, it was written by a woman. And I didn't know, but there wasn't a many books there and I bought two or three of them. And this book was written by this woman about this bronze serpent. You know, they kept that bronze serpent and made it an idol for hundreds of years. In 2 Kings 18, when Hezekiah becomes king, and according to the Jews, Hezekiah was the greatest king that almost qualified to be Messiah of all the kings. He was 25 years old when he began, and he reigned for 29, which meant he lived 64 years. And whenever in scripture you see the king's mother's name mentioned, that's just a sign. Remember Timothy, whose grandmother and his mother raised him in, to be a good, good God-fearing Christian Gentile? He did that was which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David did. He removed the high places. He broke down the images. He cut down the trees. And he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made hundreds of years before. And this book was pointing out the fact that we worship the past, but we don't depend on God for our future. That just amazed me when I read that. Okay, Steve, you want to finish the chapter? From there they set out and camped in Wadi Zered. From there they journeyed and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that comes out of the border of the Amorites. For the Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb and Sufaf, and the wadis of Arnon, and the slope of the wadis that extends to the site of Ar and leans to the border of Moab. From there they continued to Beir, that is, the well where the Lord said to Moses, Assemble the people that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing to it. The well which the leaders sank, which the nobles of the people dug, with the scepter and with their staffs. And from the wilderness they continued to Matanah, and from Matanah to Nahaliel, and from Nahaliel to Bamoth, and from Bamoth to the valley that is in the land of Moab, at the top of the Pisgah, which overlooks the wasteland. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn off into field or vineyard. We will not drink water from the wells. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your border. But Sihon would not permit Israel to pass through his border. So Sihon gathered all his people and went out against Israel in the wilderness and came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Then Israel struck him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok as far as the sons of Ammon. For the border of the sons of Ammon was Jezer. Israel took all these cities, and Israel lived in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon, and in all her villages. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab, and had taken all his land out of his hand, as far as the Arnon. Therefore, those who use Proverbs say, Come to Heshbon, let it be built, so let the city of Sihon be established. For a fire went forth from Heshbon, a flame from the town of Sihon, it devoured Ar of Moab. The dominant heights of the Arnon, woe to you, O Moab, you are ruined, O people of Chemosh. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to an Amorite king Sihon. But we have cast them down. Heshbon is ruined as far as Debon. Then we have laid waste even to Nopha, which reach, reaches to Mereba. Then Israel lived in the land of the Amorites. Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they captured its villages and dispossessed the Amorites who were there. Then they turned and went up by way of 
Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out with all his people for battle at Edre. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand and all his people in his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So they killed him and his sons and all his people until there was no remnant left him, and they possessed his land. Then the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan, opposite Jericho. Okay, so very quickly, they come up against Shihon, who would not let them cross into his land. But Israel smote Shihon with the edge of the sword and took possession of all his land. Verse 33, they turned and ascended by the way of the Bashan, and they came across Og, king of Bashan, and went out against him. So God gave complete victory over Shihon in a war. And then when he come across Og, he says, Do not fear him, for into your hands have I already given him and his people and his land. So you shall do this. What you did to Shihon, you shall do to him. They smote him, his sons, and all the people of Og until there was none left, and they possessed the land. Here's the last verse of our Parsha, and it's the key to the rest of the book of Babemar and all through the book of Devarim. Now, the people have come out of the wilderness. It's like they've come down a hill. In Barstow, California, in the 60s, the, the city was in a valley. My dad's aunt and uncle lived at the top of a very huge hill where the houses stopped. Behind them was desert for hundreds of miles. You had to go up this hill. You go up a block or two and then you come to a level place to where you could actually stop and then go on and on and up. At the top of this hill, you could look down over the whole city, and in the distance to the north, you could see a little line. And that was the highway that people would take from Barstow, California to Las Vegas, Nevada. That road was full of ups and downs because it too went through the desert. And when they had flash, flash flooding, instead of letting the water rush over them, destroy the roads, they had these little gullies where the water would rush out faster. They've come down out of the wilderness finally. That way, to the west, was Canaan. Over here was River Jordan. But between the Jordan and on the east side, we're going to read this verse over and over. And they encamped on the plains of Moab, on the bank of Jordan, across from the city of Jericho. Before we close, I want Janet to read part of the prayer of Nehemiah in chapter 9, verses 18 to 22. Nehemiah goes back to the beginning in his prayers to, to, to deal with the situation that the people are in in the book of Nehemiah. Go ahead. Even when they made a molded calf for themselves, and said, This is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them for the wilderness, in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, so they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. So, when God was merciful to them in the past, that's where you go. You start your prayers. Because you don't have anything else to depend upon except the mercy of God. Verse 19, Yet you, in your manifold mercy, 
never forsook them in the wilderness. Someone asked the question earlier of why he didn't just not give them water for a while or something. Because of his mercies, he couldn't see people suffer. Our half Torah is Judges chapter 11, the saga of Jephthunah, and our Brit Hadashah reading is in chapter 2. I'm going to close Torah reading with the Torah blessing, and we're going to move on. Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and implants eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you. We're done. Well, I didn't know you said we had till noon, and it's afternoon. Oh, okay. Well, then turn to chapter 11 of Judges. While, while you go there, I would just like to, um, I happened to look down in, in the Humash. Now, this is the rabbi's writing, commentary, on the rock, okay? This is what they say. The definite article indicates that this was a known rock. That this rock, they understood, was not just any rock. This was a special rock that Moses struck. Now then, with that, we would think of 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Um, he, Moses, uh, Paul writes, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah, Christ. Paul, Paul identifies in 1 Corinthians 10, this rock that he struck twice, and this was the problem, that he struck it twice, and the way he did it, but they even, this is so amazing, that's why I love to hear what they have to say, they recognize because in the Hebrew, the definite article is by the rock, with the rock, the rock. You understand what I'm saying? You have Messiah. David was a Messiah. Moses is called a Messiah, but they're not called the Messiah. When you have the definite article with Messiah, now you're talking about the Messiah, okay? It's the same thing with Hasatan. You, if you say Satan, that could be a work of Satan. But when you say, ha, when you say Satan, but if you say Hasatan, Ha in Hebrew is the, the Satan. Then you're talking about the one and only. And any time in Hebrew, if you have the definite article, then it sets it apart as the one. And so this is why. So this is so important in the Humash here that they're saying the definite article is with this word rock. So they are already know this is not just any rock, this is the rock. And so then Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Christ is the rock. See, so it has to do with, he broke, he hit, again, this is really what we said earlier, he struck the rock twice Messiah was struck once and in the way he did it. But, but it, I, hadn't, I haven't marked in the Hamas, but I didn't see it at the, when I first, but I just, my eye went down to it. And it, it it's so amazing. But it's in the Hebrew, you see, they see the definite article with the rock, and so it makes them know this is not just any rock, this is the rock. And David's point on Miriam is absolutely I'm, I'm certainly correct. Mayim, uh, water, and uh, Miriam, the only thing added is a resh in there. Her, her name is spelled the same, only she, she does have a resh in her name. And she was known, I'm sure, John, you know, uh, she was known for the springs of water. They had water. John's not hearing me. <laughs> I, heard, I know he knows that. The water was re related. The yeah. springs of water, Miriam, uh, she was, she was, uh, it was, there was a connection with Miriam and the, and the springs yeah. of water. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Mary Ann, would you want to read chapter 11 of Judges? This is a very disturbing chapter. It, from the beginning of the choice that God made of this new judge, Jephthah, and we're going to read about this thing that he did that we don't really understand what it means. But at some point, we all, the church seemed to go through a period of time where they were trying to understand this situation. But go ahead and read the first 18 verses first. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begot Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bore him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they threw Jephthah out and said to him, You will not inherit our father's house, for you are the son of a different woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, an idol. Worthless men were gathered to Jephthah and went out with him. And it happened in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader so we can fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Then why are you coming to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Therefore, we are turning again to you now, so that you can go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and Jehovah delivers them before me, will I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Jehovah is a witness between us, if we do not do so according to your words. Then Jephthah went to the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them, and Jephthah uttered all his words before Jehovah in Mizpah. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Go ahead and read to verse 33. And Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Israel of the children of Ammon, saying, What do you have to do with me that you come against me to fight in my land? And the king of the children of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from Arnon even to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Therefore now restore those lands again peaceably. And Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the children of Ammon, and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Let me please pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not hear of it. And in like matter they sent to the king of Moab, and he would not consent. And Israel stayed in Kadesh. Then they went along the wilderness and circled the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of Arnon, but did not come within the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of, Bo of Moab. And Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Am Amorite, the king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, Let us pass, we pray you, through your land into my place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his border, and Sihon gathered all of his people together and pitched in Jehaz and fought against Israel. And Jehovah, God of Israel, delivered Sihon and all of his people into the hand of Israel, and they struck them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorite, the inhabitants of that country, and they possessed all the border of the Amorite, from the Arnon even to the Jabbok, and from the wilderness even to the Jordan. So now, Jehovah, God of Israel, has dispossessed the Amorite from before his people Israel, and should you possess it, will you not possess that which Chemosh, your God, gives to you to possess? So whomever Jehovah, our Elohim, will drive out from before us, we will possess them. And now, are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strike against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and her towns, and in Eror and her towns, and all the cities that, that are along the bank of the Arnon, these 300 years. 
Why, therefore, did you not recover them within that time? I have not sinned against you. Yet the king of the children of Ammon did not listen to the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. Then the spirit of Jehovah came upon Jephthah, and he crossed over Gilead and Manasseh, and crossed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he crossed to the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed to 31. 33. 33. 33. And Jephthah vowed to Jehovah and said, If you will without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon will surely be Jehovah's, and I shall offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the children of Ammon to fight against them, and Jehovah delivered them into his hands. And he struck them from Aror, even until you come to Minnet, twenty cities, and to Abel Cherimim, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Thank you. We we'll get here in the t verse twenty and twenty-one, where we just read in the Parsha about Shihon being destroyed when he came up against Israel, and then the back here in. Uh, Verse 30 and 31, in his zeal, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord that saying, whatever comes out of my house, my house when I get home, I will offer it up as a whole burnt offering. The wording is really complicated here because Whatever is in a house, there's only certain things in that house can, can move on their own, right? And most of those things are people, right? So he's offering up someone in his family as a whole burnt offering. And we know in the rest of the chapter, between 34 and 40, as soon as this came home, his daughter came out dancing and singing a song about his victory and he tried to get God to annul the vow he made. And the story is, she said, give me two months, Father, to visit whoever I want. And then verse 40 says that to this day, at a certain day of the year, they go out and lament for the daughter of Jephthah, the Gilead, for four days. I've never been able to find a commentary that actually says what happened. Most of us have been led to believe that she became like a, a like a nun. She didn't have any children. She didn't have the pleasures of womanhood. But then again, if that was so, why would you lament somebody for four days? Yes. Judges, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. On the third day, hello. 
On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Yeshua's mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Yeshua replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Yeshua said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This the first of his miraculous signs Yeshua performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Thank you. Verse 5. Most of the Bibles have a word that's italicized in it. That's not in the text. So verse 5 should read, His mother said to his servants, Whatever... He you hear him say, do, hear and do. We put it on the end to make it a, a formal, proper sentence. But that's not the way the Hebrew is written. It says, if you, what you hear, do. So, any questions or comments? His first miracle, water and the wine. say the wedding scene in the chosen is amazing because it really gives you I you gives you insight as to what could have happened when Jesus told these people what to do with the the water the, the bins and it was just amazing the chosen uh, I forget what episode it's on but it's it's the whole wedding of Canaan beautiful I want to look right real quick. Come on up here to the mic. Um, back in our half tour in verses, uh, I know I just saw it again. I missed it. He's talking about Balak. Verses 25, 26. Guess what? Next week's Parsha is about Balak and Balaam. Go ahead, Duffin. I love this passage of the... Uh the first miracle, the, the wedding, because God used that to kind of chastise me once. And here's what he taught me out of that lesson. Uh, when uh, Yeshua's mother went to him, she just told him the problem. She didn't tell him how to fix it. And God reminded me, Delphine, when you come to me, just tell me the problem. Don't tell me how to fix it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. David, oh, go ahead.
Come up to the mic. Do you think there's something about the six jars of water as it relates to Miriam in any sort of way in the wedding? I'm not, I'm I don't not. know about the, the, in this reading was the focus on six jars, 20 to 30 gallons of water. Yeah. Would that in any way relate to Miriam? Uh, I guess not. I'm just pulling. I'm just pulling the strings. Or does it relate to the water for purification? Yeah, or water for purification. Good, Janet. You know, it's turned into wine. Yeah. Anyway. Well, we'll find out next year when we study this again. <laughs> well, Go ahead. The scripture says there's stone water jars, and the Lord refers to us as living stones. And that rock following. Six days, six days of creation, and then seven. As we, as we talked about in the opening, the six days of creation and this being Sabbath, of course, is every week we have a picture of the kingdom age. That's really what we're walking out. It, this is a festival today. This is actually the first festival of Revelation, I'm mean, sorry, Leviticus 23. So six, uh, you have six jars. It, it definitely could be a connection that, again, like in creation, you watch these numbers six, then there's a wedding, on, and then we go back to the third day. You see the seventh and the three actually in scripture are connected connect into the same thing. So remember what he said at Mount Sinai. I'm coming down, and I, this has always been really anointed to me. On the third day, I will meet you. The wedding is on the third day. So if we pick up the prophecies, this prophecy in Hosea is a huge prophecy. So I don't think there's anything in text that is not meaningful. When you see a number in text, that has got meaning. And the revelation comes as we begin to know what these numbers mean. We know six is what? Six is a number of man, but what else is six? Physical completion. The world was completed in six days. The seventh was the day of resting. Six, Joan, uh, these, then he turns what? water into wine Best and water into wine we know wine is joy and the joy is really going to come in the we're, we 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 won't tell we haven't tasted of joy till we enter into the kingdom and, and that kingdom is actually i believe the kingdom is now i mean in a measure not in its fullness certainly but as we walk out the Father's word, that is walking out the kingdom. And really that's what Paul's saying in, in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. When he said, when you do Sabbath, when you do the festivals, when you keep Rosh Kodesh, when you eat a kosher diet, you are showing forth Messiah until he comes. So you're already beginning to walk out the kingdom dimension before he comes right now. We're out of time, I know. Thank you. Hey, Steve, would you pray over our lunch? Father, we bless you, Lord. We thank you for this day that you've set apart, made it holy, Lord. As an example, Lord, that we're to look forward to the messianic kingdom to come, Lord. We just praise you for that. We thank you. We thank you for the meal that we're about to eat of, Lord, and, and your goodness in, in those that, that have helped prepare the food, Lord. We ask that you bless them and bless our time of fellowship in Yeshua's name.
Jamie Gibson has worked uh, in the Middle East a lot, and we, uh, some of you gave to the project. He's there now, and she's going to give you just a quick update. Okay, Debbie? Mostly I'm doing this just because I covet your prayers for Jamie and his son, his son Judah. <laughs> Judah will be 16 in August. So right now they are in... Uh, Turkey on the northern uh, shore of the Black Sea and he's meeting with the Afghan churches that he knows there uh, people um, that he teaches on a zoom Bible class on Wednesday so he's meeting with them and today actually is the second most holy Muslim celebration and it has to do with the sacrifice, the willingness of Abraham to sacrifice his son Ishmael. Well, we know they've gotten that a bit screwed up, <laughs> a bit wrong, but they will actually be sacrificing. And so this is something that the Holy Spirit can use. So Jamie asked that... Um, because they can see a connection then with our Father, Yeshua, you know, and Yeshua's sacrifice. So pray that the Lord would use that and that he would continue to um, provide. He provided no problems on flying over there. So praise God, that's got to be a miracle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Heavenly Father. I just thank you for your provision for Jamie and Judah, that you provided all that they need to do all that you have for them to do, that they ha you have divine appointments for them, and that they will speak your words, not their own, and that people, people who are new to, to faith in Yeshua will be strengthened and encouraged during this time. And I ask that you would provide the strength and the courage for Jamie and Judah as they continue this work for the next two and a half weeks. Thank you, Lord. Amen. just like to ask if there are some of you here today we don't have a lot of time but would like prayer today um, we could do that before we um, connect with Adat Yeshua now that's supposed to be about two o'clock um, I don't know if that's gonna start right on time or not but uh, we want to be ready if the, if the, you know it does so uh, when maybe 
Taylor, you'll be able to tell when they start, you think? <laughs> so Taylor can flag us. So I just want to, if no one has special requests, good, Janet. Yeah, ever since he had, it, did, did something happen or he just that woke? It flares up. Yeah. Welcome to the A, the group. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is true, you know, there are just times that we have certain things happen to us physically. Well, John's prayed for so many people, it's going to be our time to pray for John. So. They put in two stints. Well, that's a real item of praise. Let's praise the Lord for that, and then we'll pray for John, okay? You have to ask. Our Father, we just want to thank you for what you have done for Rick Patton. Father, we just thank you, Richie Patton. We just thank you for how you work in our lives. One day we're well and the next day we're in the hospital. But we know that you're sovereign. And I thank you for what's been communicated that you have spoken to him and he understood your words. We thank you that you have taken him at a right time that the doctors could help him. Thank you for the medical advancements that you have brought forth. We know that everything that happens is because you've given the revelation and understanding. We thank you for the medical field. We thank you for this team that worked on James's brother. And we just pray that this will be life-changing for him, not only physically, but spiritually. And we just bless your purposes and may he come into a place of destiny from this time forth. And we just bless you and praise you and give you thanks in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you. So I'm going to ask uh, Brian if you come and, and lay hands on John. And if any other others feel to to come and just lay your hands on John and let's Let's just pray for him. Just wait on the spirit, and as you feel the spirit leading you to pray aloud, we just indicate, and I'll pass you the mic. Bless and praise your name, O Lord, that you were the one that knit John together in his mother's womb. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, that, that you dwell every single cell in his body. And that includes every single cell with those muscles and his lower back and the hip area that just are, seem to be inflamed right now and tight. And uh, we just speak peace. We speak shalom to every single cell right now in those in those muscles that are tight we we come against all inflammation in Yeshua's name all swelling gone now inflammation be gone now in Yeshua's name and we pray lord that his vertebrae all the way down to his hips lord would be completely aligned top to bottom that that if there's any misalignment from the pulling of the muscles that it be completely corrected now in Yeshua's name Lord, we come out of agreement with the spirit of infirmity. We come out of agreement with the spirit of inflammation or 
illness or disease or um, just any s sort of um, infirmity, whatever John's going through, we come out of agreement as a group. I know John comes out of agreement with any diagnosis that's been pronounced over him. We come out of agreement right now, Lord, because we are citizens of heaven. John is a citizen of heaven, and as a citizen of heaven, the work has been done. It is finished, and he walks in divine health. Father God, in the name of Yeshua, you sent Yeshua to die, for not just for our salvation, but for our infirmities and our afflictions. And so Satan has no right to accuse this man or afflict this man with any illness or any pain or any infirmity. And so we come out of agreement with that. And in the name of Yeshua, by his blood, we have been healed and we speak healing over John right now. In the name of Yeshua, praise you, God, for the work that you have done and that we can walk in divine health. We just do. We receive it. We don't even have to ask for it because it belongs to us, Lord. And so I, I just, in, for John, ask. I don't have to ask. I just speak divine healing, divine health over John right now and pray that he would never feel any more pain or or uh, discomfort in his back and his spine. And I just pray that any time that feeling comes on, he would just stomp his foot and say, no, I have been healed in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. It's all stiff and sore today, but it's not pain, you know what I mean? Okay. But sitting really upsets it sometimes if I sit a long time. Don't yeah. speak it over yourself anymore. You are free of that. Yes. Amen. It's only one report by Yeshua's blood. You were healed by His stripes. You were healed totally. Yeah, I declare the perfect alignment yeah. with the kingdom. Your body holy. <laughs> Name of Jesus. We, yes. we spoke it. We speak it. Yeah. We speak the word. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Roland, we need to pray over you. Roland's going to come. <laughs> we're going to pray over Roland. Um, he goes next month. Uh, to be evaluated for the treatments that he's had, we're going to pray for he total healing. So uh, he has prostate. He's had he's had treatment for prostate cancer. So <coughs> thank you, Father. Okay. On December the twenty second, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, I didn't learn that until January the 31st, and uh, I had prepared to, uh, after that to go to Oklahoma City to Stevenson Cancer Center to have radiation treatments. There are special treatments that go directly to the prostate, so uh, as opposed to chemo. So I did five treatments there and a couple more trips down there. I have one more trip to make, and that's um, um, July the 19th. I go back for a three-month checkup, and they will determine what my status is. I feel great. Uh, I feel physically uh, healed uh, from the prayers. I, I appreciate so much, uh, you know, what y'all have done. Uh, help me answer prayers. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say. To, uh, to your mothers and your grandmothers, pay attention to your young children. Uh, your we have a yeah. doctor. We're going to be connecting you with a doctor okay. here shortly, so we want to pray for okay. you. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so let's just wait on the spirit again, and as you feel uh, the Lord leading you, We want to speak the word over 
over Roland and and that which uh, the Spirit has shown you, uh, the the faith is so important in speaking the word. So some uh, is the stronger your faith in what has already been pronounced in the word, bringing that forth is so good. Accomplishing in his body, we praise you, Father. Thank you. Amen. We give you thanks for, for Roland Lord, all he is, the gift that he is to, to this body and this community, Father. We just pray that you would enforce the shalom of God over his life in every way. He dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He abides in, under the shadow of the Almighty, Lord. All those things are true eternally, Lord. Let them manifest themselves in this temporal realm, in his body, Lord, through healing of every infirmity, Lord. In Yeshua's name. Father, may Roland keep his eye on you as you are lifted up like that snake on that pole, that, you, that he looks unto you, the author and the perfecter of his faith, and that his eyes would stay on you. Perfect peace. Amen. Roland, can you just say that you come out of agreement with the spirit of cancer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just say it out loud. Lord, I come out of agreement with the spirit of cancer. Yes. Mm -hmm. I praise you, Lord. Yes, praise you is exactly right mm -hmm. because we walk in divine health mm -hmm. and by his stripes, Yeshua yeah. has already healed yeah. all of our diseases. We yeah. walk in divine health. Yeah. Yeah. Praise Father, I thank you for yeah. my brother Roland's faith yeah. because I've seen his courage and his boldness yeah. and his faith that he's maintained yeah. uh, throughout this season of, in his life, Father. And he has not wavered, Father. That's he's good. a person of inspiration. Yeah. He has declared since day yeah. one, Father, yeah. that you have Father, I just remind you as I speak your word over Roland. Father, you said even when the enemy comes in like a flood, you said you raises up a standard against him. So, Father, we ask for that standard to be raised up right now. Father, I remind you of Psalms 91. Father, you said no evil shall befall him. You said neither shall any plague come near his dwelling. And, Father, we stand upon those words right now. And, Father, also, Lord, I just remind you, Father, what you've done for one, you would do for the other. Father, as you sever the relationship between me and my oncologist, I ask that you sever that relationship between him yes. and his oncologist, that he will have a good report, yes. Father, when he goes down on the 19th, in Yeshua's name. No more need for treatment. No, no, no more treatments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. No more Amen. need. Amen. No more. Amen. No more. Amen. No more. Yes. He is yes. cured. Can I give a praise report? <coughs> father, I thank you that you healed my father from stage four cancer. And his doctor called him the miracle man and he had just went through it like it was nothing at all. So thank you, Lord, I do pray that for Roland, Lord, that you that he will be your, uh, your other miracle man, one am among many. And also thank you too, Lord, this group laid hands on me several months ago and I, those respiratory things I was dealing with. And uh, Lord, I, you have healed me. <coughs> Even if I have a little bit there, that's just Hallelujah. that's not part of it. So yes. I thank you that you have uh, you brought healing to my body as well. In Yeshua's name, we give you the glory. Thank you. <laughs> I just release the spirit of joy over you. I mean, the the spirit, the joy of the Lord is your strength. In Yeshua's name, I cancel, break off all the spirit of fear, worry, anxiety, and just uh, release the spirit of joy. Uh, holy laughter into your life. Yeah, yeah. In Yeshua's name, yeah, your body being made whole right now, whole your life being made whole by Yeshua's blood, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. The joy of the Lord. Yep. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we just speak blessings over Alice and Roland. We thank you that they love you. We thank you that they stand on your word. We thank you your word is powerful and active in them and that they are healed in the name of Yeshua. Yes. We bless your name, Father, to be exalted in these lives. We bless you to glorify your name through Roland and Alice and all of us, Father, 
We want to be to the glory and the praise of your name and the name of your son for what he's done for us. We give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> the joy's coming. <laughs> wow. We had those holy laughs, and if everybody got the holy laugh in here, it will be amazing. I'm, we've been through that sometimes. They are so, that is so good. <laughs> when the holy laugh comes, it is so wonderful. It'll make you hurt inside. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we're going to hope that we're going to get connected here. Um, and until we do, let's just, uh, let's just be praising the Lord and keeping in a state of prayer. And um, we just pray for Susan Fellman right now as she prepares to teach the Torah and speaks the word of life, breaks open the word. We just bless her today, Father. We bless Adat Yeshua. We bless all the Messianic congregations in our city. Father, we bless your work in this city. We bless your name and your word and your Torah to go forth into the churches and into the uh, Gentile lives and, and Jewish people. Father, let your word run swiftly and let it come alive, Father. We just ask you to do a great work in our time that we might praise you. Father, we speak blessings. We speak blessings on the convocation coming up. We ask you, Father, to begin now to prepare people for our gathering together with the Messianic leaders speaking. Let a great work be done. Connect us, Father, to your purposes and your will and divine calling. In Yeshua's name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. I would like to lead some prayer for the political situation in our region uh, while we wait for the connection. Uh, so, Father, I, I want to lift up those who are running for office all around our city, Lord, all around our region, and the important issues that are on the ballot on August the 2nd, both in Missouri and in Kansas. And, Father, I ask you to draw the hearts of everyone who wants to do your will, who wants your will done in our region. Lord, I ask you to help each one to fully enter into the plans that you have created them for. And Lord, I ask you to help us to put aside strife. Lord, help us to honor you and encourage one another. Father, I ask you for your powerful intervention in our city, in our state, both states, and in our nation, Father. We ask you to elect those that you have set apart to do your will in the, in the Senate, in the House, in the legislatures, in the counties. Lord, we cry out to you for the sake of even of our children and grandchildren, Lord, that you will do your will. And Father, I ask you for your 
mercy on the families of all those involved in this heated situation this year. Lord, extend your grace and your wisdom. In Yeshua's holy name, amen. Uh, Father, I want to intercede for Taylor right now and um, also for Adat Yeshua and this connection and the start of this meeting. But Father, I just want to intercede for my dear brother, uh, Taylor. There's no pressure on him. And uh, so we're just here to see what you're up to, Father. And uh, we just lift this whole situation up to you and just take the pressure off of Taylor right now in the name of Yeshua. Chronological contiguity from what happened before, what's happening after, have many factors involved. And um, but there are two um, ingredients in this that tend to historically in Christian circles be what I call turn the uh, turn the turn the other page kind of text. Sort of like it's there, we read it, we know what it says, but what to do with it or how to explain it. It seems sometimes unethical, immoral, extreme. We don't know how to contextualize it after all. Uh, we, right now, don't have a red heifer in, at my backyard, and I'm not thinking Ministries of New Life has one in their uh, hallway at this point. Uh, and then there's all this confusion about, uh, is there a red heifer out there to use so we can reinstate the sacrifices, or whether it's really actually necessary? And I. I it's our view here that it probably and most likely would not be. Uh, and uh, so when we read books like Great Great Planet Earth to talk about the end times, it goes back to you have to be old enough to remember that. And um, so we know within the Orthodox world and in some evangelical circles, there's all is trying to cultivate a red heifer without a, any kind of blemish or any, if you will, hairs that are not red. And all of these concerns about this um, and we find that somebody grew one in Indiana and they're shipping it to Israel and oh, they discover two microscopic white hairs and it won't be valid. Uh, those sorts of issues are not our issues here because they're a little obtuse to the realities or what it is we want to learn from the text. But there's still mysteries about this red heifer, why all the details that surround it and it seems so ancient and therefore not applicable. 
And I think we're going to discover some very, very significant connections, even going back to the Garden of Eden as it relates to the red heifer. The other thing about this text has to do with the striking of the rock. And then we always deal with that, oy vey, Moses is the most humble man. He was a servant of God. He did everything. And uh, he does one thing wrong, and he gets kiboshed. And that also becomes a controversial text. And I think we're going to actually resolve that difficulty here today. So I'm going to give it over to Susan. She's going to lead us in our time of study. We're back. Hi, everybody. And um, I just want it to be known that my husband is one of the most brilliant men I know, and we think very differently. So I give myself away to not be so brilliant. Um, I just want you to know that. Most of you do know that already. So um, today I have a few questions, and we're going to read um, as we normally do. So we're going to read this first portion about the red heifer and have some things to talk about. Um, our, our parsha has a lot of ingredients in it. And I'm going to have a question for you after we read it. So we're speaking these words into the earth as we read it for all of us to understand, though I hope you already read it before you came. So if somebody could please read the first 17 verses of chapter 19 of the book of Numbers. I can read. Thank you, Eric. I am uh, the Bible translation I'm reading from is the uh, Stone Stone Edition Humash, if okay. anyone cares. So if it's got a word that's different, it's uh, um, that's why. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the decree of the Torah which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and they shall take to you a completely bred cow, which is without blemish, and upon which a yoke has not come. You shall give it to Eleazar the Kohen, and he shall take it to the outside of the king, and someone shall slaughter it in his presence. Eleazar the Kohen shall take some of its blood with his forefinger and sprinkle some of its blood towards the front of the tent of meeting, seven times someone shall burn the cow before his eyes its hide and its flesh and its blood with its dung shall he burn the kohen uh, that's a priest uh, shall take the cedar wood hyssop and crimson thread and he shall throw them into the burning of the cow the kohen shall immerse his clothing and immerse himself in water and afterward he may enter the camp and the kohen shall remain contaminated until the evening the one who burns it shall immerse his clothing in water and immerse himself in water, and he shall remain contaminated until the evening. A pure man shall gather the ash of the cow and place it outside the camp in the pure place. For the assembly of Israel it shall remain as a safekeeping, for water is sprinkling for its purification. The one who gathers the ash of the cow shall immerse his clothing and remain contaminated until the evening. It shall be for the children of
I will come out against you with the sword. The people of Israel replied, we will keep to the highway. If we do drink the water, either we or our livestock, we will pay for it. Just let us pass through on foot. It's nothing. But he said, you are not to pass through. And Edom came out against them with many people and much force. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel passage through its territory. So Israel turned away. Thank you. Blood spilled everywhere. So water, blood, blood, and water. Wow. They kind of go together. To make the ritual cleansing of the red heifer's blood, it had to be burnt into ashes. It had to have a scarlet thread in it and some hyssop. And then it had to have spring water to make it to be that ritual cleansing. And here we're going through all of the events that have all of the parts of this um, that make us have a reason for needing it. It's kind of amazing. Let's, let's go back to the waters of Meribah shortly. And the staff um, that Leah spoke about in my translation, it says the rod. And it's like the rod. And the rod that was used was the rod that was Aaron's rod that was taken out of the tabernacle when it says, this is the person you shall follow, that the Levites are the ones that you're going to follow. Okay. And it was that very rod. And what happened to that rod? Put in the Ark of the Covenant. It was put in, but what, what was different about that rod than all the other rods? It budded. It sprouted. It was it was sprouted, budded, and had almonds on it. Fruitful. Okay. It was all the things. It was all the things that needed to be done. So in looking at that rod, they're seeing the faithfulness of God from beginning to end. From it being a bare stick, like in the wintertime, to budding, blooming, and becoming fruitful. And so God said, speak to the rock with that rod in your hand. And for one time, Moshe lost his patience. And what did he do instead? He struck it twice. <laughs> he hit it twice. And who was he really hitting? God. He was hitting God. You want to say something, Rabbi? Yeah. Uh, let me qualify that a little bit, um, because it has to go back to the first time in which God did command to strike the rock, the first time waters came out. And um, um, why is this so different? It's, uh, I think it's, it's customarily say, well, he was so angry, he lost himself and he struck it twice. I think uh, actually there's more in the text that's specific that doesn't have to go in that direction. Um, um, I don't want to unpack all of that here and take up time for academic discussion on it. Um, but um, notice he says, uh, we, and he's not saying God, but um, he is almost like he is the agency by which the water would come out because they're turning to him for it. They're not really turning to God. And so that is itself a problem um, in terms of Moses's posture. But um, this is my take on it. In the first striking of the rock, if you read the Hebrew carefully, uh, I will stand um, before you. Actually, this, it's, it could be translated, I will stand there between you and the rock. So... Um, this is, in Judaism, they say there is no vicarious atonement, like the Christians have said, that God himself would be the source of atonement. Uh, there's no place of vicarious substitutionary atonement within the biblical tradition. So why are you making that up? It's just a metaphoric application to create a new religious system about Jesus and atonement, if you say that he was God. Uh, but in fact, it, we do have vicarious atonement 
in this first incident, because God stands between Moses and the rock and before the people, God is willing to give himself up and to be struck by the creatures he's created for the sake of bringing Mayim Chaim, waters of life, uh, to restore, to show that he's even willing to give himself to complete the journey of the redemption that ultimately would be the full promises of God. So God allows himself to be struck in between Moses and the rock, and everybody sees that. Uh, now, what happens here is that Moses didn't do what God said. Of course, he, well, he instructed, speak to the rock. Why? Because how many times, you know, how many times does Jesus have to die for you? Yeah. <laughs> if he's the one to for all sacrifice, and just the fact that God himself would come incarnationally and allow himself to be slaughtered as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, you know, is he to be crucified over and over again every time we sin? So um, what happens is, is that it becomes presumptuous and negligent and unholy because God already allowed himself to show that he's willing to give up his life or to be stricken, smitten, right, by the people, or in this case, Moses, uh, representing the people for the sake of waters of life to come uh, from him. Uh, uh, and uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, water giving life. You know, you could also talk about when he was speared, the separation, the blood and water. We could have, uh, uh, it might have come to people's minds that there's a becomes a kind of symbolic gesture there. Um, uh, when you talked about water, blood, blood, water. Um, so this is the sin. Uh, the sin is, is that the people were drawn away from the reality of what the God did in the first place, number one. And number two, made the striking of God a common thing. Oh, we could just strike God anytime and we're going to get water. Uh, this goes to an idolatrous core of human beings making God their puppet for their purposes. Uh, he already did it and he showed that. This time with the budding rod is symbolic, uh, but the, uh, the present speak to the rock so that uh, it shows that God ongoing. So he sacrificed himself initially should be adequate for any following provision of God. So uh, speak to the rock because it's only God that's revealing himself. And because of the first vicarious atonement of standing between Moses and the rock, then Moses goes ahead and God, get, and he strikes God uh, and uh, who's there. So, uh, I mean, I already said, it. I mean, do you want to, does Yeshua have to be crucified every time we're thirsty? Um, you know, so, um, uh, be, so look what you've done before the eyes of the people. You've taken, you've undermined their faith, their understanding of who I am, because uh, I'm just kind of a vending machine at the expense of you as my creatures striking me. I mean, what creator dies for his creatures? So he did that literally with Moses the first time, but it's, it's, it's unrepeatable and ultimately the most unholy thing that would symbolically be given to the people because it undermined the whole revelation of God's provision for the people in the eyes of the people. And, um, there's the there's the crisis. There's the seriousness of Moses' sin. Uh, I'm sure I, I've said it better in the past, but I'm yeah, just kind of so, yeah. I'm just throwing <laughs> it out there. Um, and I know we have a whole group of people um, mentioning new life, and we talk in ways here that might seem like, wow, where are they going? And that went by too fast, and and never heard that before. And so it's awkward to be able to uh, uh, to put that together in a, a quick sense of point of reference. So I'll, I'll let ministers new life spend the next year trying to sort that out. Okay. Let's see if they're laughing. Are they laughing? I don't know if they're laughing. I can't tell if they're laughing. Well, they haven't turned this off, so, so we're still okay. good. Um, one other small comment here is after God gives Moshe and Aaron their rebuke, it doesn't say how they reacted at all to this rebuke at this moment. All right, which I think is slightly important. And from there, Moses sent messengers to the king of Edom 
and they got a refusal. Yes, Vicki. <clears throat> There's something that's kind of goes over the top of our heads here. Number one, Aaron was supposed to be Moshe's spokesman. And in this case, Moshe loses his temper and he speaks out in anger. And Aharon fails to stop him. Therefore, we see that Aharon precedes Moshe in death. And he did not get to go over into the promised land either. And this is, and it is this incident that stopped both of them from going in there. Okay. Thank you for that. And I just want to go back a little bit. Um, who is Miriam to Aaron and Moshe? Sister. Sister. Their sister. And she just died. Yes. I think they were a little like sad and like still yes. in grief over the death of Miriam. We don't stop and think about that very often. What death of a friend or a sister, a brother, a mother, a father can that do to us. That's it an cannot, extreme stress on the side. It can undo yes. us, you know. Yes. Um, doesn't take even that much sometimes to undo us. Sometimes when people around us are sick, we're deeply, deeply grieved and concerned. Maybe this sometimes but happens was, in church wait, circles oh. that uh, uh, people... Or begin to stir against the pastor and kvetching and complaining and not paying attention that they're just human beings too and they might be going through personal realities. That that does happen, but I, I do think that's part of the backdrop here, and um, it's shocking. The two men that fall on their faces and plead for all of Israel consistently now act in a different way, and Moses calls them for what they are. You rebels, and all the other times he pleads for their on, for mercy on their behalf. So, may I make another one more comment? Sure. The rod, according to when you go back to seventeen, the rod was put into the uh, ark or the tabernacle as a reminder of the rebellion. So it was a representative of rebellion to start with. Okay. So um, God yeah, likes that, show and that tell. Might be, uh, yeah, that might be a reflection and an opinion. We're not well, I, no, I agree with that. Yeah, that might be I agree case, that but, whether but, uh, it's a reflection yeah, or opinion. Yeah, we don't tend to characterize our contributions as uh, declaring what is true. We're just making observations. The dots that we've connected. Yeah. So, okay. So now we're going to go on and we're going to start in verse 22 and read to the end of the chapter. I can read. They journeyed from Kadesh and the children of Israel arrived, the entire assembly at Mount Hor. Hashem said to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the children of Israel, because you defied my word at the waters of strife. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up to Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his, of his vestments and dress Eleazar his son in them. Aaron shall be gathered in and die there. Moses did as Hashem commanded, and they ascended Mount Hor before the eyes of the entire assembly. Moses stripped Aaron's vestments from him and dressed Eleazar his son in them. Then Aaron died there on the top of the mountain, and Moses and Eleazar descended from the mountain. When the entire assembly saw that Aaron had perished, they wept for Aaron 30 days, the entire house of Israel. Okay. So that's a little bit different than our scenario with Miriam, right? Right. They wept for 30 days. And I, I want us to go to the heart of Moshe at this moment. Um, back, I don't know what chapter, but back in the chapter where Aaron and Miriam spoke against Moses and God gave Miriam leprosy, Moses didn't say you deserve that. He prayed into the Lord for her life. 
and God healed her, but she still had to stay outside the camp for seven days. And here Miriam's died, and now he has to take the high priest's clothing off of his brother, his older brother. Just think about what that feels like, Mm. disrobing him, dismantling him. And and I I see two old Jewish men (laughs) crying on one another, literally, tears pouring out. Who would want to do this? Um, I... I put something on my Facebook. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook this week. And it was written by a lady who is a hospice worker. And it talked about death. And it said, when, when death happens, we get a little frazzled and like, what do we do? What do we do? What, I, what do we do? And her article said to just take time and be with that person who died. Because eternity happens in that moment. And the person who died is going from this life into the next life. And there's a beauty. There can be a beauty in it. I don't think drive-by shootings make that beautiful at all. So I don't want to add that into that. But if you're holding the hand of a loved one as they pass from their life into the next life. And that's kind of what we see here is Moshe and his son, Eleazar, Aaron's son, Eleazar, are with him as he passes into the next life. Now, how old is Aaron, my math friends? Oh, I've lost count. Aaron, 86. So Moshe is 120, and Aaron's older than he is. So that'd make him 120. Mm. Is he 123 or 126? Somewhere somewhere in that vicinity, right? Right. And um, when you love somebody for that long, how hard is, is it to pull yourself away from them? They were partners in all the all the facets of God's kingdom. And so when they came down the mountain, and once again, Aaron died up on a mountain without everybody knowing exactly where that spot was, except for it was on the mountain. And they wept for 30 days. That is a huge statement about the dearness Aaron to the community. Aaron's also the guy that... um, did the golden calf for them. So sometimes they liked him. But like I said before, we're entering now into the last months before they enter the land. So there's a lot quickly going on. How many people had to die before they get into the land? Oh. About 600,000 or 598,000. 603,550, <laughs> actually from that census that they took, had to die before they got there. So they didn't get to do this for everybody, but it's kind of nice to know that they did this in honor of Aaron. Are there any other comments before we, yeah, Keith. I'd connect this in story we're talking about here with the the actual occurrence of the red heifer, because Elazar also appears in that passage too. Because it says that the red heifer should be brought before Eleazar's face. It should be slaughtered before his face. And there was one other mention of it happening, something going on in Eleazar's face, all up in his face. So he's, he's in one sense, that red heifer is Eleazar himself because it's, it's the red heifer on which the yoke has never come. So now the yoke is coming on, um, on Eleazar. So I don't know what the connection is exactly if... If the high priest functions as a, and I know this is a little bit Christological, but if the high priest functions as that cleansing um, sacrifice or vicarious sacrifice for Israel. Okay, that is very good to think about. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'd like to just give a homework assignment to read Ezekiel 36 in light of what uh, was just mentioned. 
um, and making the connection of the priestly function and the purification rites uh, on behalf of Israel. So just like Yeshua is the embodiment of Israel, that I think he is identifying a proleptic, an anticipatory identification with a one single prophet that becomes the emblem of the embodiment of Israel in relationship to the um, faithfulness of God to restore and purify Israel from exile, from sin, as well as physical exile, which Ezekiel is literally in the context of. So that's a wonderful study to see the correspondence of Ezekiel 36 to much of what has been talked about. All right. So we're going to read the conquering of peoples and um, have a little more tragedy going on. But as we read this next chapter, 21, together, there are many of its words that are in our Siddur that we read from every Shabbat. And may they anoint your heart with the victory that God has as he's leading his people into his promised land. If somebody could please read chapter 21. I can. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, then he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utterly destroyed them and their cities. Thus the name of the place was called Horma. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loaf this miserable food. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that the many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. And Moses made a bronze servant, serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Now the sons of Israel moved out and camped at Obeth. And they journeyed from Obeth and camped at Erberim in the wilderness, which is opposite Moab to the east. From there, they set out and camped in Wadi Zered. From there, they journeyed and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that comes out of the border of the Amorites. For the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Wahib in Supa, and the wadis of the Arnon, and the slope of the wadis that extends to the site of Ar, and leans to the border of Moab. And from there, they continued to bear, that is, the well where the Lord said to Moses, Assemble the people that I may give them water. And Israel sang this song, Bring up a well, sing to it. The well which the leaders sank, which the nobles of the people dug, with the scepter and with their staffs. And from the wilderness, they continued to Matana, And from Matna to Nahalio. And from Nahalio to Balmoth, and from Balmoth to the valley that is in the land of Moab, at the top of the Pisgah, which overlooks the wasteland. Then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn off into the field or vineyard. We will not drink water from wells. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your border. 
that Sihon would not permit Israel to pass through his border. So Sihon gathered all his people and went out against Israel in the wilderness and came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel struck him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabok, as far as the sons of Ammon, for the border of the sons of Ammon was Jazer. And Israel took all these cities, and Israel lived in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon and in all her villages. For Heshbon was a city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and had taken all his land out of his hand as far as are known. Therefore, those who use Proverbs say, Come to Heshbon, let it be built. So let the city of Sihon be established. For a fire went forth from Heshbon, a flame from the tower of Sihon. It devoured our Moab, the dominant heights of the Arnon. Woe to you, O Moab! You are ruined, O people of Shemosh. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to an Arno, Arm, Amorite king, Sihon. But we have cast them down. Heshbon is ruined as far as Debon. Then we have laid waste even to Nopa, which reaches to Medeba. Thus Israel lived in the land of the Amorites. And Moses went to spy out Jazir, and they captured the villages and dispossessed the Amorites who were there. Then they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went out with all his people for battle at Edre. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand, and all his people and his land, and you shall do it to him as you did to Seal, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So they killed him and his sons and all his people until there was no remnant left him, and they possessed his land. And lastly, but not least, as then the sons of Israel journeyed and camped on the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. So they finally got to that place where they were about ready to cross over. God had told him, told them that he would take care of them if they would have entered the land all the years before. But the amazing thing is that all the nations still remembered Israel and the things that God had done for them. It wasn't something in a deep, dark past. It was still on the threshold. And the other thing that is majestic here, if you can ever call war majestic, is that Israel and its encampments and its soldiers were still well-trained and ready to go up to war. They weren't this small tribe trampsing around, just, you know, being ready to beat up, be beat up by somebody else. They weren't, they were fit and they were ready for battle and they went up with their um, banners in front of them. There was a procession that went on that we learned of earlier in the book of Numbers with, you know, who set out first and, and where the Levites came in and how there was a protection of the things of the tabernacle in the middle of the encampments as they set out. So we don't think of Israel very often as this military base, but actually it was very safe and they set out and they got to a safe place. And the rabbi would like to talk. Well, I just want to make mention, um, we'd be remiss to not know that the Haftorah portion for this week is Jephthah and uh, in Judges 11. And to really add to understand, and one of the things we tend to be remiss of is that we have these Bibles with all these maps in the back of the Bible, and we never look at them. Uh, all of this is clear on the map. Uh, on the other side of the Jordan, from the south uh, upwards, from Edom all the way up. And so we see Moab and then uh, Anon, we see Ammon. Um, and in fact, it leads uh, ultimately to the Jabbok River, which I always make note, that's where Jacob became Israel. And uh, so um, Israel ultimately, its first encampment after the destruction of Jericho is directly across from the Jabbok River. So basically, God is just bringing us back to the story he had in the first place. So we had a 400 and some odd year hiatus, 
with activities, but the story of God's purposes in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are now going to continue. He's going to have his way. Uh, so we need to look at the map. But if you study uh, Judges chapter 11, it actually repeats all of these details. And that's why it becomes so significant that Japheth, and thinking about the fact that he was born of a prostitute and an outcast, and yet God is using him, and the story is extraordinary. Um, but Heshbon is mentioned, and uh, these places are all mentioned. So it becomes a recapitulation of this story and kind of a restoration or a way by which God has to rectify um, uh, what was meant to be by using the judge Jephthah concerning these land portions that we're finding in this journey um, that we find in our passage today. You cannot, um, um, the Bible interprets itself, so you cannot appreciate the story that was just read without going back, actually, uh, or going forward to what happens in the book of Judges in chapter 11. So I want to come back to one thing, and that is my question at the beginning, when did this red heifer happen? And I liked Keith's response and following the text that it was done before Eleazar, the priest. And so maybe it happened then and not at the beginning or as the rabbi said, it was a bridge between the two. Um, you have to keep reading. You have to keep learning. You have to keep putting the pieces together. Some things are mystery until God reveals it to us. And always have more questions than you have answers, because then you get to find something else out. Vicki, you have your hand ready to go up, I can tell. There's a um, couple of things here. Uh, it doesn't mention who, who settled where, but on the east side of Jordan, a large <clears throat> number of Israelites had already settled on the east side of the Jordan. And then when they begin to parcel out the land, some of them get really upset because some of them want to stay on the east side of Jordan. It's interesting when you I pulled up my map and this a large part of it, this is in present day Jordan. And a large part of this was um, the, was it the British mandate that oh. laid out a, what Israel was supposed to be. And most of this here was in the British mandate. This was supposed to be Israel. And it is well, now Jordan. And, and it, it may occupied be, by the by the Muslims. Long. And it still might may be supposed to be it Israel. is supposed to be, yeah. And we are the agents of prayer and support um, and the watchers to watch God do miraculous things. In our portion, we saw many miraculous things and um God does that. And sometimes we just have to pay attention to what is miraculous and what is ordinary around us. I'm going to say beyond a shadow of a doubt in my head, every day, every week, God does miracles for you in your life. Amen. You just have to pay attention to them. We can miss them. Some aren't so big. Some are small. But sometimes the small things are what gives us the greatest joy. The other thing is that... Because of the promises of God to his word and to his people, that we need to follow him in his promises. We need not to sway and move to the right or to the left. We need to know that he is who he said he was, and he gives as he was going to give. We need to pray for modern day Israel. They um, are worse politically than we are in America, if there ever could be such a thing. And um, there's different sects of every kind of Judaism under the sun, from the ultra, ultra, ultra Orthodox to the very secular and everything in between and all the issues that we have in America. But I do believe that for the purposes of God, he set people like ourselves here on this earth, pray for them and to help them come into the light 
of what Messiah Yeshua brought to them so many years ago. We should be thankful. I know I am thankful. Um, in John chapter 17, talks about Yeshua praying for his disciples and even those that come after them and come after them, which includes us, that we can follow him, but may he give us opportunities, each and every one of us, to find people to take on this journey with us in his name. Let me just pray over us today. Father, I thank you for today's journey. As we journeyed, um, maybe we jumped ahead 38 years today. The Lord, we know the sorrow that you suffered on behalf of Israel in this journey. And we thank you that you go with us even in our difficult moments. And when we're in sorrow, that you share that with us and you lift that load and take it upon yourself. But I pray that you give us each opportunity to seek you deeper, to know you better, to love you more, but to share with somebody who needs you and doesn't know you yet. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Shabbat Shalom. Next week is Balak. And uh, be ready. Yay. Walking donkeys. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. shalom. That's There's shalom. a lot of talking donkeys out there. A lot of talking donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, everyone I didn't get to say, a... I'll remind everyone the um, <laughs> Tosh, the word for serpent, as in the brazen serpent, has the same gematria numerical value as Mashiach. Ooh. If, you, if you look that up, you can make your own connections. Nachash and Mashiach have the same gematria, which is kind of wow. a, its own little thing. Wow. And by the way, uh, Eric, I, I pray for you, 